Great. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, we're here. We're very excited to be here. What'd you say? I know. <laughs> it's terrible. So let me quickly frame up the conversation. So we're talking about biomimicry, land races, and how to grow regeneratively indoors to get the best medicine. And so I just want to kind of frame it a little bit. We're talking about a three-legged stool here. First, you have the soil food web and the water that you bring to the table. Very, very important um, to get healthy, healthy plants. And it's really essentially the plant's condominium as well as its food pantry when it's in living soil. Oh, that was weird. Uh-oh. Sorry, guys. I think it just crashed. Okay. okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Next, you have sunlight, full electromagnetic sunlight. I'm not talking what we're talking about, full spectrum LEDs, not the same thing. We're talking all the way from UVB all the way out to far infrared. Extremely, extremely important. <coughs> Finally, you have the genetics which is very important as well. So we're going to talk about all those things. I'm going to keep my remarks short for obvious reasons. So how we're going to do this is we're going to do a quick intro of each panel member and shoot it off with a question to them. So Brett Leonard will be first. He's a visionary. He's an award-winning award -winning filmmaker and futurist. If you don't know him, he pretty much created the term virtual reality and um, through the Lawnmower Man, uh, his award-winning film. He's widely recognized as a thought leader in virtual reality. And we bring him here today to help frame up this question. We heard all kinds of discussion around, we need to normalize and get rid of the stigma here. So, Brett. Hi, so, uh, hello. <laughs> I don't have laryngitis, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so I come at this as a storyteller. I'm on a panel of distinguished scientists and inventors and geneticists and all of that. And, and really, you know, looking at and listening to a lot of the panels here uh, on cannabis, one of the biggest questions, actually at the luncheon that just happened, the very touching uh, panel during the luncheon with the veterans and all that, it's about education about reframing the stigma around this 80-year prohibition around this medicine and there's a big missing blind spot in there which is story we have to be able to tell the new story which is actually a very very old story of what cannabis is of what actually will create the best medicine the best effect in culture and what cannabis culture is writ large outside of the ghettoization of you know stoner comedies and very very small amounts of real information involved I impacted in a, in a, a large uh, amount of disinformation that's been going on for decades and so i come at this as a storyteller saying that the time is to actually put energy investment and, and time as a you know as a hollywood storyteller i'm very uh, committed to telling the story of cannabis lifestyle of cannabis history of what's going on for real in the cannabis world right now in terms of the corporatization, the, the, uh, you know, the, the small farmers, what the, what's happening with them, all of these struggles, all of these stories, the great story that was just told by um, uh, the mother of the child that, that had autism. And you know, the, all of these are great stories for us to tell on a very large scale. There needs to be a Star Wars of cannabis. There needs to be the ability to create the context for this because all of the struggles of getting out this information of an education need to happen in the context of telling a large meta narrative and that means many many stories uh, I'm involved with a number of companies digital ignition out of New York who was very involved with some of these technologies in the cannabis and media and, and uh, electromagnetic spectrum areas uh, my company studio lightship with my partner Josh Shore who were very focused on telling stories that are a hybrid between virtual experience and traditional media and our company sonic science which is about utilizing sonic electromagnetic spectrum to help affect 
cannabis grows and other botanical grows in a very, very scientific uh, uh, process that comes out of resident science, which is really changing so many things now. And all of these have behind them a tremendous narrative, characters, emotion, and story. And that is what I'm here to hold down, is this idea that it's now time to tell that in a very large way and not ghettoize the, you know, the, the, the overall area of cannabis storytelling and, and cannabis lifestyle in the way it has been for so many years. And so some of us from the Hollywood environment and this new em emerging media environment like with virtual experience need to bring these things together in a convergence where we actually get the truth out there in a way that's entertaining and really compelling, not just a number of documentaries, because that's never going to move the needle enough. We have to make it on a much larger scale. That's right. We're in, we're in the midst of a seismic transition. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brett. Yeah. So um, second on the panel here is Jeff Lowenfels, and Jeff is the longest running gardener organic gardener columnist in America. He has a trilogy of books. If you're interested in them, he has them with him today. Um, teaming with microbes, teaming with fungus, teaming with bacteria, nutrients, sorry. And he's in the midst of um, getting his next book out to uh, the public, and it's called uh, DIY, DIY Auto Flowering, correct? And so we're very excited to have Jeff here today. If you don't know him, you soon will. And um, Jeff, we would love for you to speak to the living soil side of the equation and specifically the importance of living soil in general and for land races. Okay, so I'm going to go real, real quick. We, we mentioned the three-legged stool. I think the most important leg is the soil uh, based on what happens to the soil with regard to the sun. I don't have all the fancy scientific equipment. Read my book. It's got it all in there. Got to look at this through my weird eyes. Next slide. So this is the soil food web. Bunch of chains, little guy eats the bigger guy. These chains are in the soil. Some of these guys on the chain look up and they can connect the chains by eating something on a different chain. They all get connected into what's known as the soil food web. What people don't realize is that 50 to 60% of the sun's energy goes into that plant and is used not to produce the cannabis flower or the, or the leaf or the stem. It's producing exudate, sweat, carbons that drip out of the roots into the soil to attract bacteria and fungi that need the carbon that's in these exudates. It's the sunlight that allows the plant to make these things. And once they are in the soil, they attract the bacteria and the fungi who in turn attract protozoa, paramecium and amoeba, which you studied in high school, and, uh, and uh, uh, nematodes, which are a true worm. You're coated with them. If you disappeared, your shapes would still be here today because of all these worms that are on your body. They eat the bacteria and the fungi, <laughs> poop out the excess that you don't need right there next to the root, and it contains plant-usable nutrients. So let me show you how it works. So here you go. We've got a bunch of plants sitting around a pool. One of them says, I want French. One of them says, nah, Mexican. You can read as well as I can. Okay, so the biggest one wins, and what happens? Well, uh, there's a, different kinds of plants. Sorry. Go ahead, another one. Uh, what happens, oh, but look at this, even more plants. All plants do the same exact thing. And so what happens is these are the roots. Let's turn them upside down. Okay, so now they're upside down. The plant produces an exudate, puts the exudate out into the soil, and the next thing you know, it attracts bacteria and fungi. Hit it. Simple as that. The bacteria and fungi are attracted to those exudates, and if the plant wanted to have a different kind of exudate, a different kind of food, if it needed something else, it would change the exudate that's made using the sunlight. Next slide. It produces these exudates, and these exudates create uh, vitamins and, and, and all sorts of, uh, you know, antibiotics and whatnot to keep things in check. So they're very, very important, and they create soil structure as well. All of this starts with the sunlight making these exudates inside the plant. And they have some very special things that they attract in terms of fungi, including the mycorrhizal fungi, which 96% of all plants associate with. You probably never heard of them, but if you don't have a mycorrhizal associate, then you die. 96% of all plants, cannabis is included, rhizophagus interacetes is a fungi that the plant must have. And if you don't 
have these guys in the soil attracted by the sunlight made exudates, then you're missing out if you don't have bacteria and fungi on the fertilizer because that's where it comes from. And if you're missing out on the nematodes and the protozoa, you're missing out on the fertilizer spreaders because those are what recycle and cycle all of the nutrients in the plants. This is how all plants operate. And if you use miracle Grow, you kill the bottom of the soil food web and then you have to take its place. But the key point here is that you must have the best sunlight possible for your plant to operate the most efficiently. If you're using LEDs that don't have a green spectrum, because they don't, then you're not giving the plant all of the tools it needs to operate effectively. So it's a three-legged stool, genetics, soil, what was the other one? Sunlight. Sun. Sun may be the most important one because it stimulates the other ones. And what I love about what Jeff brings to the table is it's not just cannabis, it's food, growing the most healthy plants. Food and cannabis are medicine. That's right. And when we got away from this stuff, our salad bowl went from good nutrient value before World War II to almost no nutrient value today. That's the sunlight and the inputs in the soil. They're ignoring the soil food web. You, as a cannabis grower, cannot, or you will be taken over by the big bad guys. Thank you, Jeff. So next, I'm going to introduce Michael Angelotti. And um, Michael's a geneticist and product development um, for the Emerald Cut products. And he's been extensively researching and developing award-winning terpene and cannabinoid-specific genetics that specialize in non-solvent extraction concentrates. Um, Michael's managed and facilitated the Emerald Cup contest from 2012 to 2015. For you not familiar with that, that is no small feat. Huge, huge undertaking. Michael has been featured across media channels as an advocate for the preservation and breeding with Landry's cannabis genetics from Central and East Asian countries. So Mike, cannabis was um, put on this earth and evolved to grow outdoors 10,000 years ago. Please give us some of the backstory. Can you speak to the genetics and the differences between um, the original land race varietals and the modernized hybridized strains that have come to dominate this market. Sure, uh, thank you, Kat. Um, I can explain to that a lot, and there is a huge distinct difference between modern hybridized cannabis now that we see in the original land races that were been growing for these 10,000 years, starting with wild species to what has been, uh, what was domesticated into what were land race streets. So what we see here in the US is that we have product from Mexico, from Thailand, smuggled into the United States beginning in the 1950s and into the 1960s. So from this point on, you have growers, these outlaw growers in Northern California in the mountains growing these seeds. And they weren't having very much good success because of the amount of sunlight, the environment, the, the growing conditions. They just were not, um, <clears throat> they just weren't the right conditions. So then you have in the 1980s with seed banks being um, established in Europe, you have indica varieties now starting to come in, into the U.S. And this is really where the, where the big, where the magic really began to, uh, where the magic happened because you have breeders out here who are now were being able to make these strains which were shorter flowering and were stronger in THC and were able to concede and to complete a uh, consistent product that actually had marketability. And this is, this kind of trend has continued the entire time up until here we are right now at this point is that we are only be breeding for high THC strains which have marketability and just get people uh, stoned, I would say. But I mean, there is a way to go back on these land races and that's what we are doing because we haven't really lost the genetics. They're still there. There's still lots of genetic diversity. It's just about making sure that we preserve these seed uh, populations. And there's many organizations that are doing this. There's the ASO, which has about 1,500 different uh, species of sativa seeds. And then we have our own group, the Emerald Cup, which has about 300 different land raised varietals as well. There's groups on Instagram who are traveling and promoting the use of uh, land-raised seeds in India and Southeast Asia. They're collecting them, they're sending them to breeders for propagation to make products. And if we just continue to work with these land races, we can really start to hone in on the minor, can the minor cannabinoids that have been kind of locked out like CBC, THCV, CBG, and things like that. 
Great, thank you. Sundarajan Mutialu is our fourth panelist, and he specialized in advanced materials, plasma physics, materials processing, and surface modification. If you want to talk about things way over most of our heads, have a conversation with him. He is the Chief Technology Officer and Co-CEO of Zentiv, and um, really controls this uh, flagship plasma lighting technology, the Sun on Demand, which produces true sunlight and empowers the cultivation of sun-grown quality, organic cannabis, cannabis in any controlled environment. So Rajan, I'd like to take us back to that three-legged stool analogy, please. Fast forward to today's marketplace of thousands of hybridized strains, and the vast majority of it is not grown in the sun and the soil, and it's grown indoors and in greenhouses. Can you talk about the biomimicry approach of the sun on demand and how it applies to preserving land races and medicine? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, I want to bring a little context before we go to, to the growth. I've uh, been here all week, uh, at least, well, not all week, but listening to these talks. And the veterans talks was uh, all the very inspiring talks. Um, we tend to put all of our medicine in one block. Um, we talk about CBD as though it doesn't work with THC. We talk about one. Uh, which one you are taking, which one we're not taking. Everybody's uh, endocannabinoid system is different. Some people it affects well and some doesn't. Uh, on top of that, we don't talk about uh, how it's produced, what you're actually putting in your body. Uh, and I think bringing context to that is that nature has already engineered all this. This is what the land races are. These have been around and used by people actually in many, many parts of the world for a long time. And when Jeff talks about living soil and we talk about land races, this is the combination you need. You need real sunlight, you need water, you need microbes, and most people, and Jeff does it well in the book with regards to what, that you have to feed the microbes, not feed the plant and most people are feeding the plant. So there's systems that are in play that people utilize. They try to get out into the marketplace, but you have to understand that the most important part of this is the plant. It's the plant that does all this. And it's the land races that have come along for many years and developed it. And so what I want to talk about is part of this is the sunlight. So 80% of what's grown out there in general is doing indoors and greenhouses out of the sun. And you're trying to make medicine and you don't have sunlight. So most of what you see it shows is trying to figure out ways to mitigate the fact that you're not outdoors and in nature. So when, what our company set out to do, and Kat was put that on, is you have poison cannabis versus real cannabis. And now I'm not saying everybody is doing this, okay? There are s amount of growers internally trying to do living soil, but that's really hard to do. So they do other things. They add salts. They add other kinds of chemicals. But that bioaccumulates in your body. Or they do an extraction. And if they do an extraction, what are they using for extracting? What is it that you're now putting in your body? Is it worse for you than the actual medicine you extracted? And how are you a pharmacist? Because now you're going to try to recombine all those into some kind of a product. The plant has already done that. The plant has already done that. And land races for that reason are so important. So what we set out to do is to come out with a way to get real sunlight indoors, is to completely emulate the, the sun. And the way we do that, and that's all the way from UV all the way up to infrared indoors, so that you can grow with living soil indoors. So if you look at this, all the other lighting sources that we typically use are only 23% of the sun. So guess what? You have to make up for the rest of the sun some way. So you do it with chemicals, or you do it with some other way, or you hybridize the plant because you're trying to get fast grow and that, but you forgot the fact 
that that beautiful plant before already had everything you wanted and you now you're trying to put it back in because you're not outside so when you look at the full spectrum of the sun everything from infrared all the way up uh, to UV UV is extremely important and the combinations of those particular wavelengths are extremely important developing that plant from start to finish and that's where you get the genetic expression full and that's where you get the medicine it starts with the plant not with us so that's what you've got to take care of so with developing that with Jeff's work that he's done in living soil we can now combine that with true sunlight and in fact bring a strain from another part of the world by changing that particular spectrum from that and grow something here because they haven't been able to do that that's why people grave up on land races they were stunted they couldn't get production out of it they won a 48 day turn and hopefully Jeff will talk about autoflower in a minute that even helps us too and especially the vets and home growers and such so having living soil having total sunlight and having a land race that's been that's been medicinally used for many years is where the magic happens thank you Sandrajan. so I, I want to ask Mike a question Mike what are the medicinal implications of the trend towards hybridization and biosynthetics and why are land races so different <coughs> Well, I guess right now we're, we're kind of really looking at two trends. We have this biosynthetics, which they're being able to make cannabinoids in the lab just using yeast and sugar, okay? And this is, right now we're still maybe about two years out from this, from actually happening, but I don't really see biosynthetics ever really being able to play, replace THC and CBD because we can make that from the whole plant extract. But what's happening is that, is that they're using this biosynthetic formula to make the minor cannabinoids, the CBCs, the THCVs, and all these minor cannabinoids that you don't find in today's hybridized strains. So you have to, so you have to look back into these land race trades in order to find this. Okay, and with being able to grow these inside with these lights and under the right conditions, you can really start to express the. Um, the true genes and the cannabinoids in these plants. And then there's another, another trend I'm seeing right now is has to do with hemp cultivation on the mass scale for the purposes of a CBD extract to make product. And one of the questions we have to ask is where is this hemp, CD, hemp CBD plant coming from? It's been domesticated here in the United States for growth here for no THC and high CBD. But what if we start to look back to the more ancestral hemp uh, varietals from say Europe or in East Asia where you're finding these varieties to have the same amount of say CBD but then they also carry the CBG and CBC and if we can start to grow these in these conditions then we can start to have these minor cannabinoids present as well with the CBD in our products. Great, great, thank you. Jeff, do you want to chime in on this and maybe talk about how auto-flowering fits well, in? Well, yeah, let me just quickly point out that what we're growing now are plants that were all bred with a Afghan plant. And we did it because of J. Edgar Hoover. We wanted to be able to grow plants clandestinely indoors where nobody knew we were doing it. And as a result, every plant out there today has these genetics, and they're not the genetics we want. Well, now, recently, uh, there have been some improvements on something known as autoflower cannabis. Autoflower cannabis is a cross between uh, the big cannabis, either indica or sativa, and rudialis, which is the weedy cannabis that was discovered in 1900 in, in the Volga area in Russia. These plants are photo period, uh, not photo period uh, sensitive. In other words, they grow based on genetics, not based upon the amount of darkness. And so they flower very quickly. Well, they tried to develop this and breed these with, uh, with uh, sativa and indica for years. In the 70s, they were successful, but they weren't very good plants. They weren't very 
very uh, useful. But finally, in the around 2000 or so, they started to really, really get good. And around 2010, they started to get spectacular. And now I believe that they are so good in terms of the breeding that these plants are going to replace sativa and indica as a home growers plant, as well as many commercial growers plant, because they don't have a photo period. They flower from seed to harvest in seven to nine weeks as opposed to seven to nine months. Seven to nine weeks, the plants are put, the seed is put into one pot, four to seven gallons, and never moved. Or it can be planted directly in the soil in the ground. In seven to eight weeks, you've got a plant that yields it yields heavily and it yields CBD if you want it, CBD, CBG, THC, whatever you possibly need. And for breeding purposes, because they're seven to nine weeks seed to harvest, the phenomenal advances that are being made have bred out powdery mildew and all sorts of things, auto flowering cannabis. If you haven't heard of it, you will be. It's the next tomato. Your mothers and fathers and uncles and aunts are going to be growing this plant because it's just like a tomato plant. <laughs> Beautiful. Wow. <laughs> so, really? so, yeah. oh, did you want to comment? Brett? Well, I just the, the, the amount of hidden stories <laughs> inside this whole area we're talking about is just I've never experienced any anything that has so many hidden stories. You just mentioned FDR, and the, I mean, there's a whole movie <laughs> there, right in that story that he just said in one sentence that no one has ever heard of before. So there's so much, so one of the things we're working on uh, with with some of the companies we're ta I talked about earlier is this idea of story worlds of creating a story world with virtual experience and traditional media. There's so many threads of stories in cannabis. We need to create a cannabis story world that can encompass all these things because a lot of this you know sounds like very confusing science for some of us that are lay people but it's actually really just at the core of it an amazing story an amazing story of how growers had to operate for many many years and then how this disinformation happened I mean it's there's a Lawrence of Arabia of, 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 <laughs> of cannabis stories here that I think is something that you know I'm very committed to telling because I think it's a, it's just a tremendous opportunity as a storyteller and just being on a panel like this and all the cannabis panels that I do just give me more and more ideas for stories that are real but need to be brought so we can bring this whole area of cannabis culture out of out of you know this ghettoization that and we're been. not even stoned and we're not even stoned <laughs> exactly well, and, and not yet <laughs> although most of my movies are better when you're stoned I will tell you that <laughs> so Brett to push Brett to push that a little further how do we get past the fog of the prohibition mindset and all the chaos of misinformation through the storytelling? Well, th this is, a, I think there needs to be a call to action in the cannabis community and that we need to put investment and energy and money and all these things into time because Hollywood, you know, as a culture is not necessarily going to do that. Why not? Well, because that's a but big... But you guys that's could. A, you yeah, could. We know how to do it, but we need to get not necessarily the money for it. It's not necessarily going to come from the studios. But not I don't not initially. It, I don't think it takes any money. We have a holiday in this industry, 420, which we waste by having a party. That's right. If we could get Hollywood behind us. Yeah. We could convince the people at PBS and CNN and other places to stop using the marijuana word, putting up a statue to Harry Anslinger by doing it every time. You I, guys can yeah. help us do that I stuff agree. with <laughs> no money at all because we have the party already set up and it's held well, every year at yeah, produ producing a big movie takes money though <laughs> but, I mean no matter what the media and producing virtual reality story worlds takes money and to get it in a place where you know it, there can be mass adoption of the story of the 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 new information that's happening you know we think there should be a an MTV for cannabis a, a channel mm -hmm. for cannabis that that is about cannabis lifestyle writ large first of all the history of it that going back 5,000 years no one even knows that history it's a very fringe thing there's a tremendous amount of information here and 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 rich gold to mine in this area but we do need to have a focus from this industry itself on creating that content. That's what I'm saying. That's interesting that you mentioned history. Mike, this is your slide up here that you shared with us. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that and you know, connect in the history of this plant? Can you see it? 
Um, I, I can't see a slide, but I pretty much know what we're talking about a little bit this. So what we have is the evolution of cannabis starting from 10,000 years ago, from where you can find it in northern India or in Mount Taishan in China, where they just had wild species growing all over the place. And then these communities then began to domesticate this and propagate it in order to make medicine, to make fiber, to make homes, to make bricks, to do whatever it is that they want to do with that. And then that's when we start to see the original land race genetics, is which, which we are talking about right now, is with land race genetics, you had, you had genetics that were bred to serve a specific purpose to target a certain market, whether it be a product, whether it be for straw, for uh, fiber, for whatever it is. And then you have this kind of domestication that, been, that then began to happen here in the U.S., in the United States, and in Europe, where it's like, okay, we've taken these new strains from all over the world and we bred them to yes just as jeff was saying to grow them indoors to grow them under the trees to make a profit okay, that was the main source of what we were doing here in the states was getting people high and making a profit and being able to survive and now this is continuing on and now we're going to have these breeding companies which are coming onto the market now which are using dna sequencing and using marker assisted breeding and finding these genetic markers in order to make the most powerful and the strongest best growing plant Okay, so we're, so we're taking it from this wild factor as it was like, whoa, look, there's wild cannabis growing all over the place to now where it's like, okay, it's in a bag and we're smoking it or it's making medicine for us. Okay, so I'm going to, thank you, Mike. I'm going to kick it over to Sin a little bit. So Sin, how could someone create this um, native microclimate indoors? Ah, well... Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, un unfortunately, cat uh, actually where you live, uh, in the desert they're putting in greenhouses. Uh, think about that for a minute. Uh, miles and miles of greenhouses in the desert where they have sun. Um, you're actually creating a petri dish when you do something like that because you can't get the, the infrared out. It's this huge wave that's the size of the pyramid. How are you gonna get that out of that greenhouse? And everything that's going to grow inside that greenhouse um, is going to have a significant amount of other things growing there as well. And then you got to clean it out. The way we've uh, approached it is uh, here's, here's a, a 500 square foot uh, grow, uh, typical grow. And these are using what they call high pressure sodium lights. Um, and half of the energy on this light goes to heat. That's why you see all those air conditioning ducts up on the top. Uh, and you can actually see another layer there. So if 50% of the light, uh, of the power is going to light, then you end up using a lot of air conditioning as well. And so, oops. So what we did is we created a plasma light, and that's one light of 1,000 watts instead of 24,000 watts to light that room up and that's full spectrum sunlight. So you actually have sunlight inside. So now you can grow like sunlight. You can grow sun-grown indoors. So you can have the same quality, you can have all the same compounds, you can pull out everything out of the plant, you get expression, you can start it from seed, you don't have to go through all that systematic grows. So that is what allows you, with living soil, to bring true medicine back in a land race. So that, oh, you're hey, turning Sin, it I, okay. I, I, Sin, I think the people who live in California, I live in Alaska, by the way, you people haven't seen the sunlight in 100 years. We're going to show it to you right now in that little box. So I just wanted to show that to you of what that sunlight looks like. And really, the bottom line for us is, isn't to sell sun lights. <laughs> We're not here selling lights. We're here to try to help the plant and for you to be able to make the best medicine. And the best medicine, we believe, are the land races. The hybridized ones are made for money, not for medicine. And yes, some of these strains can also be for adult use as well as medicine. Isn't that a wonderful thing to do? To be able to do both and not have to choose? So having that, you get full plant expression. 
which is what you want. You want, and instead of being your own pharmacist, again, I keep saying that over and over because it scares me to death that people are doing extraction and trying to mix it all together as though they know when the plant knows. And they've been using those medicines. And just like Mike was saying, uh, some of these land races, which ones do you believe from a health perspective grown naturally in sunlight is doing the most or has done the most good? I guess in our research for what we found when it comes to minor cannabinoids, which are not, when you're, when you're not having strains that are so dependent on THC or even on CBD, are going to be the land races from northern India. We're finding that there's extreme high amounts of CBG that are being produced, and it's not actually converting into CBC or THC or CBD. It's just staying as CBG, which has tremendous health benefits. And then we're also finding land race strains from Uzbekistan, which are really high in CBC and still very low in THC. So you're looking at almost like one, it's like a one to one to point one or something like that. Was the last test that we had done was one part CBC to one part CBD to that point one percent of THC. And CBC is an incredible cannabinoid when combined with CBD to alleviate Parkinson's disease. You could have CBC, um, which is completely non-psychoactive and is also really great for um, stopping cancer cells from growing. So if we could really take these strains in, indoors and, the, and like Jeff was saying, if we could somehow breed them to have a shorter flowering cycle with these minor cannabinoids, it'd be incredible. Because trying to grow an Uzbekistan strain that's 19 weeks, it's just no one's doing it because it's not profitable. It just takes too long. But if we can grow these indoors and shorten these flowering times through this breeding, by finding the proper strains that are going to express their genes, then we can really start to make headway for these minor cannabinoids. Okay, so Jeff, uh, I was going to, I'm sorry to jump in here, but what do you think with regards to having sunlight and microbes? Could you explain that to the audience? Well, again, the, the sunlight creates the exudates. And so if you don't have the proper exudates and if you don't have an efficient way for the plant to make the exudates, then, then you're losing there. A lot of these microbes are sensitive to sunlight. Some of these uh, microbes are photosynthetic. Uh, the algae, for example, are completely uh, photosynthetic. And uh, a lot of the larger members of the soil food web are sensitive or attracted to light and react as well. And so when you have poor light, you end up with fewer exudates, you end up with a, an exhausted plant having made those exudates, and you end up with a soil structure because it's the microbes and the soil food web critters that make the soil structure, that's no good. And so the better light, the better your soil is going to be because the better your microbial diversity and numbers are going to be. So great. We have a, a couple more minutes left. I'd love to open it up to the questions. audience for questions. See if anybody Look has Look at the any. shadows behind you. Look at the shadow behind you there. <laughs> All the, the way across the wall. That's sunlight. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. You know, I think it's pretty easy. First of all, you don't have to smoke. You can eat, obviously. Uh, and you can vaporize flour in a flour vaporizer, which many people don't understand exists, where you just heat it up. Okay, so you can do that. You know, the problem is that it's the big guys that are going to take this diluted stuff. Uh, and when you, when you put that cartridge in your mouth, you don't know about the lead in it. Nonetheless, what's in the material itself? And it's not just the material that's going into your system. Who made this stuff? And how about the employees that are doing that as well? And then let's go all the way back to the grow, which got a powdery mildew. And so they had to spray it with some chemical. Think about the worker. They didn't tell you about it. You don't know what's in your stuff. And boom, 
So really, you wanna, we, we wanna make sure that we can preserve and keep growing a craft industry that's organic by nature because the big guys are not going to be, period. That's right, as a consumer, please do your research. Know your grower, please. Yeah, you need to know your grower. And the other thing is, education's really important. Um, the products that you're getting out, you don't, you need to know where it came from because you are putting literally poison in your body when you buy some of these products because of the, just the way that they have to grow it. And there is no writing on, there's no uh, ingredients uh, tags yet. I wish there would be. Because you're talking about children that you're giving this to, or your elderly folks. I gave it to my mother. She just passed away last two weeks ago. And you have to be really sure about what you're giving them. So you have to pay attention. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. You have a follow-up. Did someone, let's go here and then. I mean, basically, you're finding that these minor cannabinoids aren't even, I, I think I'm addressing your question right, where these minor cannabinoids aren't even found in these produced, in these strains that we're using, these hybridized strains, which are going into most of the products right now. I mean, the, the closest you're going to find, I think there's one, there's one product that was just tested, Doug's Varen, which is six to seven parts THC to THCV. And other than that, they're not finding these cannabinoids in these hybridized strains that we're growing now because they've been bred out because you were just looking for high THC strains, and now we're only looking towards the hemp varietals that were domesticated here in the U.S. only for CBD. So I guess this is what, it's really hard to really study these land races and to work with these because they are so long, and it takes a lot of research to really to find these and to do this. So I think that in order to really prevent biosynthetics from taking over in the CBC and these minor cannabinoids, then we really need to start cultivating these high, these hemp varietals that have these chemicals, that have these cannabinoids in them, because we're not going to find them in these THC strains that are used to get you stoned. I think so, I addressed that, right. Oh, one more question, quick. Doug's Varen. Doug's Varen. So we're, per we're almost out of time here, so Let's do a quick 30 second wrap, wrap up from each one of these guys. Um, you know, how can we continue to get back to the future of this plant and this beautiful medicine? Yeah, stop using miracle Grow and, uh, uh, you know, uh, general hydroponic uh, fertilizers and, and return the soil food web to your soil so that once you do get great light, it can, it can really do what it needs to do. And we have to tell the story of that. We have to tell the true story of cannabis and cannabis lifestyle and the fact that it is a medicine. The fact there's so many things. It's not just about a stoner comedy with, with the, one of the Franco brothers. It, you know, it is, it is something much farther beyond that. And uh, I'm committed to telling those kinds of stories. I guess uh, from, I'll do it from the business perspective. Uh, you have to differentiate yourself in the marketplace. You cannot continue to be a Me Too product and deliver a Me Too and you kind of could just CBD craze is going nuts everywhere. You need some THC with that CBD. It's not going to work. You're just going to buy stuff that's just absolutely wasting your money and not helping out. You got to educate yourself a little bit and about this. And then you got to protect your IP. So how do you protect your IP? You've got to figure out ways of getting plants that you grow, that you choose, but when you do this, as, as, you, as Michael was talking about, you, you're just basically going to lose a lot of the medicinal benefits. Okay, crossing it one time and crossing it back, perfect. Don't go any more than that because you're going to lose.
You're just going to lose just for trying to get an IP to sell something. And then don't go off after the market what everybody else is selling and try to do that. Look what happened in Oregon. Everybody in the market with the same thing. Growers that were using regenerative farming, growers that are growing in sunlight and natural soil are still selling at $2,500 a pound today. Well, everybody else is sending it five hundred dollars a pound. A gram, not a pound. What's that? Twenty-five dollars a gram. Gram. I'm sorry. Yeah. Twenty-five yeah, yeah, yeah. hundred dollars a pound. <laughs> anyway, so the other thing is just educating, education, education, education. Yeah. It's very important. So, Michael. And I would guess just um, know your medicine and know the people that are producing it. Know your farmers. There's a great thing they're doing at. Uh, with Flow Canna, where they're bringing in all these farmers, all these small farmers that are doing regenerative work that are up in the hills of Mendocino and Humboldt County, and they're bringing them under this brand so that they can actually survive. Because up in Mendocino and Northern California, we can't compete with these large, like, 100 acre farms down in Santa Barbara that they're mass producing cannabis, okay? It's going to put these other people out of business up north, and it's already doing that right now. So the thing is just to try to support the local growers, find the medicine that best works for you, and also just kind of just be patient because we're going to begin to weed out all the other, these large corporate growers and these stuff where these kind of imposters that are just trying to make a brand and they have no authenticity. They have no, they have no roots, okay? So if you can find these brands that have these roots and really trust in these people, then they're going to make great medicine and it's going to heal this planet. One last item, uh, if there are veterans out there or you know a veteran, please have them contact me. I have cannabis available for them for free through the growers that we work with. Yeah. So, so please. Sorry, Senator Rajan. If there's one last takeaway for me, Mother Nature is the best engineer on this planet. She put this plant here and she knows what to do and this plant knows what to do. So let's stop trying to dial it in and go back to nature.